All right. Good afternoon or good morning, everybody. Um, so here we are, and I hope that um, I, I can see, and I hope that many of you are returning. Um, it just, I know we've had some really good, um, I, we had some really good questions in the last couple of sessions that we've had. And also I know that these, um, the last models that we've been seeing throughout uh, this month, have, they really work off of each other. And so therefore, um, if you haven't had the opportunity to see some of the other modules, um, I know these are posted, uh, or different versions of these are posted on the um, National Hispanic and Latino MHTTC's uh, YouTube. Um, uh, account. And so I highly recommend you go there because in addition to me, there are many other really engaging speakers and really engaging topics that I know um, have been covered over the last weeks all the way through the last years um, that are really, really helpful, especially as we're talking about these topics. And so today we're going to be talking about engaging and treating Hispanic and, and Latino clients. Um, if you remember last week, we talked about the ecological validity model where it talks about just how to understand culture. And um, really when we're assessing and when we're thinking about making treatment interventions culturally adapted and culturally appropriate, we talked about just kind of the nuts and bolts of what we were even looking at as we start approaching our our evidence-based treatments. How do we how do we actually work with it? You know, what what is it that we're changing? And so I was really, you know, and so so kind of moving from that, now that we've talked about those fundamentals, today is really an opportunity for us to talk about that, that piece that's even harder to kind of put our finger on. And that's the engaging and treatment. Um, as I think so, as I, I was I was kind of reviewing for this presentation today, I started thinking about what does engagement meant and strangely enough what came to mind was telemarketers um you know in, interesting I, I thought to myself and so you know once in a while you get a telemarketer um who's calling you and recently i i had this um you know somebody called me from a local gym you know and so here we are at the end of covid um i haven't really done much but it's not really a, i don't really find it like a big problem in my life i certainly wasn't thinking about it but when you think about what telemarketers have to do they have to you know find first of all somebody who um who who this whatever product they're selling is relevant for and so so i got this call from this individual and she's like hey you know what we're looking at gym memberships we're selling them you know and you know what what stopped me first was the whole I should, you know, probably think about doing something. This is, you know, thinking about health and that sort of thing with all of the, you know, we're going into the winter season. And so so she caught my attention because the topic was relevant to me, but I didn't really feel like I needed it at that moment. Um, and so so we started that wonderful interaction where her whole job was to engage me, you know, see if she could within the next three minutes that she had my attention um engage me as to why i might need her product or why i might be why she might be relevant for my life and so and and as i think about that phone call you know what i recognized a lot of it had to do with just how she was you know in talking to me you know if she had come up with you know kind of come off with that we need to do this this is important you have to do this there's no choice i probably would have shut it down pretty quickly and not even listened to her but one of the really good things that she was good at was asking questions, finding out about my interests, finding out about what was really relevant to me. And then from there, you know, as we interacted, she made herself a real human, you know, talked about her own experience and what she does and that sort of thing, which just as, as a person, all of a sudden I'm like, oh, well, this person is interested, interesting to me. You know, I'm enjoying the conversation. But in thinking about it, I had to, you know, it had to be relevant and she had to really start to find out about me and then change what she was talking about so that it was relevant to my life, you know. And so as we started talking, um, in the end, yes, she did sell me some sort of, you know, package that, um, you know, we'll do this again. <laughs> New Year's, you know, January 1st is coming and I know we all do it again then too. So we'll see how well it lasts. But as I think about that, and I think about how when clients come to us, you know, often they're like, you know what, I'm going to try therapy or wherever you might be, you know, whatever kind of service, whether it's case management or some other, you know, mental health service, you know, groups and individual, they come into us either being sent by someone else or they come in on their own volition and say, you know what, I think that what, what is here might be helpful for me. And then is our job to start to bridge that gap, both with who we are, you know, just as, as people, but also with 
helping understand, um, helping them understand what they're really looking for and how our services can match with their need. Um, it's a little salesy and I know, especially I'm a social worker. I don't like sales. I never went into sales, but at the end of the day, it's just that human, you know, human connection that then makes them go, Oh, I totally get this, you know? And so, so we're going to talk about just how, how we make ourselves more relevant, um, when we're trying to assess their need and, and meet it with the, what we're providing here. All right. So, um, so if you have attended before, you might know a little bit about me. First of all, I have no conflicts to disclose, um, but I'll tell you a little bit about myself as we start. Um, and so I am a licensed clinical social worker, as I mentioned. I also have a doctorate in social work and I have a certificate in addictions counseling um, here. I'm in the state of Illinois. And so um, I am the hospital administrator for a large state hospital, in a psychiatric hospital. In addition, I also do private practice working with individuals who have addictions, specifically sexual addictions and chemical addictions. Um, and so uh, that, is, that is my specialty. And I've been doing this, I'm working with individuals um, with addictions for over 20 years. And specifically because um, I also offer these services in Spanish and English. Um, and my own family um, is, you know, my, my family of origin is uh, from Mexico. Um, and so looking at that, I have a passion for working with this population and being in my area, it's certainly um, a, a population that we see a lot. And so with that, you're going to, during this presentation today, you're gonna to hear a lot about my own stories and just my own you know, point of view of how, how I've gotten here. Um, and so today, here is what we are gonna do. You know, here is our ending goal. So our learning objectives today, we're going to talk about best practices in the engagement and treatment phase of substance use treatment with the Hispanic and Latino client. Participants will be able to identify three cultural elements that inform mental health assessment and treatment interventions with Hispanic and Latino individuals. Also list and discuss at least two specific evidence-based interventions and techniques in Latino mental health. And then you'll also be able to demonstrate two culturally informed assessment and treatment techniques shown to be effective with Latino clients. You know, and so today it's really that, you know, interacting and then actually applying treatment and what sort of treatments are uh, most helpful. So one of the things, uh, the treatment that um, I use most and I teach on it and I talk about it a lot is acceptance and commitment therapy. Um, but there are many others, you know, when we're looking at behavioral um, treatments such as CBT or other uh, family therapies, and we'll talk about more of those later. As we talk about this, you're going to hear a lot just about my, my belief that values are so important in our engagement. Um, and some of this comes from my own theoretical orientation. But when we look at many, many clients when they come in and when I say, well, how can I help you? Yeah, what do they say? I just want to be happy. Um, in reality, constant happiness um, is actually kind of miserable because you know then anything that causes you any pain, you get rid of, which I mean, it's just a horrible cycle of trying to avoid pain, which doesn't happen. You know, that is not what life is about. And so what I always approach clients with, you know, what I always offer them is perhaps our goal isn't constant happiness, um, but perhaps our goal is, is peace. You know, peace with the choices that we make, peace with um, the the decisions that that we move forward with. You know, often we will have decisions in life, and when we can go, you know what? I made that decision, and I know it was hard. I didn't like having that conversation, but it was right. You know, it was right for me. It aligns with what's important to me. Those kind of moments in life bring us that peace, and that's really what we're bringing our clients toward um, in any of our our treatment interventions is bringing them toward that feeling peaceful um, with the choices that they've made in life and with where their life is now so that they can have their best life. Um, and so with that values, but specifically cultural values are embedded in every interaction. Um, when I define values, because often people talk about things they value, like, well, I value my house, it's important to me, I like living in it, um, or I value you know, members of my family, when we look at, and so when we look at the actual term value, however, these are um, concepts. And so when we think about the ecological validity model and the importance of concepts where values fits in. And so these are concepts of, you know, these are the things that raise to priority. And so, so think about, you know, let's say you have a friend, 
Well, I'm sure you have many friends. So you have a friend who says, hey, you know what? It is, I, you know, I really need to talk. I had a hard day. Can you come out and meet with me? I just really need your support. And then um, coincidentally, you also have your boss that says, you know what? We have a hard deadline on this. Um, I know you say, said you'd finish this project before it's due and there's just a little bit more I'm gonna have to give you. And so I'm sorry, unexpectedly, you're gonna have to stay, you know, a little bit late to, to work today until you finish it, you know? Um, and so now you have this, this choice. You know, it's the, okay, do I, you know, I, I committed to finishing this report. Um, you know, my boss is asking me to stay late to finish it. Um, you know, let's say there's no, you know, work repercussions if you don't, you know, you really have this choice. Or do you support your friend? Either choice is correct. There is no wrong choice in this. And you can, you know, even pose the question to family and friends and everyone might have a different opinion on what you should do based on their values you know so we have the family uh the the value of um family or friends you know relationship you know some of you might be very relational where it's like ultimately relations come first i don't care what work wants i don't care what anyone else in the world is asking me for my relationships supporting my family and my friends that comes first in my life and that's great you know it's wonderful you know it's a good value to have others of you might say you know what my commitment to my work, it's my responsibility. Um, you know, responsibility is very important to me. And so, you know, even though either one I could put off to the next morning or, you know, whenever, you know what, that responsibility, I committed to this. And so I'm going to be there for my commitment and make sure that I do, you know, do what I committed to or do what my job is asking me because my job, that's my responsibility, you know. And so both are perfectly fine answers. You know, it's it's not even a real ethical question. It's all based on your values. And so as we go forward with clients, and uh, you know, often I do supervision with individuals and often there's the, well, what's right, what's wrong, what should I, you know, recommend or, you know, where where should I go with this? And it really is based on what do you value, you know, in your in your therapeutic relationship? What does the client value in their life? And can we identify these well? And so with this, it's, we're looking at our personal values of like me as the individual, but then also my family values, my community values, and then my cultural values, because all of this impacts what I'm going to value in any given decision, you know. And so with this, providers really need to be familiar with the cultural values, because within certain cultures, there's certain things that are extremely important. Um, you have to have also have an understanding of your own beliefs and values. I know I'm, you know, I use that example. I'm a responsibility person. And sometimes I know I've probably, you know, made uh, decisions that could have been argued because it's the whole, hey, you know what? I committed to this, I, this report or whatever it is. I have to, you know, this, my responsibility is super important. I can't just like, you know, change or, you know, that's my particular value. I understand that. And so when a client is telling me, yeah, you know what, I know I committed to that. And sometimes, especially when it's like, um, maybe not showing to their therapy session. I'm like, we had a commitment. You told me you were coming. What do you mean you just like decided not to, or you decided, you know, meeting with your friend was more important. Huh, you know, it like blows my mind. However, I have to understand that's my value, not my clients. And so when I can understand where their values come from, you know, within their culture, within their personal life, then I can start to go, ah, you know, this is actually what we're looking at. And so being aware of values that increase client engagement and also in values that impact healthcare. And these can change. Often as our clients develop insight into their experience, they all of a sudden start going, oh, well, that's not a value. I, you know, I thought that doing whatever, you know, I, I saw modeled in my, my, my family that doing what, you know, that eat, that, uh, um, all of a sudden I'm thinking that cleaning your plate. My family of origin taught me cleaning my plate is the most important thing. I must do that because, you know, they're starving children in, in China or wherever they are now. Um, and all of a sudden they're like, but health, health is actually my value. And I recognize that that's not helping me and my, you know, my value with health, let's say, you know, and so that's, that gives us an opportunity to start looking and going, okay, well, what does that mean for your behavior, you know? I have an assignment that actually I give to many of my clients as we're looking through this particular thing and that helps me understand. And basically, um, for those of you that have the opportunity to assign homework in your therapies or in the work that you do, um, some of you may, some of you may not, often I have my clients write an autobiography. 
And I have some questions that often I share with them, you know, to kind of give them a, a guideline just of, okay, let's talk about the values and the norms that you saw as you were growing up. Let's talk about what impacts you now. And then let's talk about what's important to you. How did people communicate? You know, what was important to communicate in your family? And so I've found that that particular activity really helps in starting to understand this, both on a cultural and an individual way. And wonderfully enough, if when the client's engaged in that, they too can look at it and um, use that to start developing their own insight into their particular values. So just a little, little Easter egg um, right there. And so um, next I'm gonna talk a little bit about cultural values that impact the engagement phase, that first kind of you know, working with your client. So first of all, you know, confianza, you know, which means trust. It's a form of mutual reciprocity, having faith that the individual help you uh, to the best of their ability based on the relationship. Um, and so, you know, I don't know if you've ever been to the doctor and I recently um, went to see a new doctor and instantly within the first 10 seconds of the interaction, I knew I liked them. Why was that? You know, I mean, 10 seconds, they hadn't told me, I don't know anything, but it was, you know, when I, when I think about it, when they walked into the room, it was how they looked at me, you know, where it was that engaged look of, hey, I see you. You know, it was even their familiarity. Hey, how are you? You know, it's good to see you, you know, as opposed to, you know, maybe coming in, looking at, a, a, you know, a chart or coming in and, you know, maybe, maybe nodding to me, but quickly sitting down and, you know, all of those body, those nonverbals, the instant the individual walked into the room, their nonverbals told me that they were invested in me and which gave me a sense of trust, you know? And so as they started interviewing me and talking and doing the assessment, I felt more willing to share maybe things that were, you know, I hesitated about because I could sense that this person was listening and I got the feeling that they wanted to help me to the best of their ability. Yeah, and that's all nonverbals, a lot of nonverbals, you know. But then the second thing, as I started, you know, as we got past the, you know, maybe first three minutes of our interaction, what they started to ask me were a lot of questions about my thoughts on it. You know, in other words, it wasn't just the, you know, okay, well, let me, let me write down to your assessment, but it was also the, what do you think? You know, what is your, you know, what is your perception? How does that affect you? You know, and so as we think about that building of trust, I felt, you know, from my perspective that I could trust this individual to help me kind of sort out what was happening in this, you know, with this problem, you know, and so, and this I think is important because it's that mutual reciprocity. And when we think of mutual reciprocity, it's not just my, you know, the healthcare provider needs to get the client to trust them. It has to be both. My healthcare provider also has to demonstrate to me that they trust me. And they do that through asking questions. What do you think? you know, well, what's your perception of this? You know, showing that they, they respect my opinion as the person experiencing the symptoms, you know, and additionally, including me in that, that kind of, that explaining symptoms, educating me on what's happening to me. And so I feel like I'm a partner there and we have that, they're trusting me to do my best to take care of my health. They're also trusting me to give a good report and I'm trusting them because I see that they're listening and attending to me. You know, and so, and I think that's extremely important, just that, that mutual part of it, um, because, you know, it's, it's easy to be trust, you know, you can do all of the right things in terms of being intentional, but if your demeanor or even your questioning reflects the, yeah, I don't, I don't want to know what you think about it. You know, I'm the expert and I will tell you what you should be thinking about it or what you should be feeling about it. All of a sudden we don't have that trust, that confianza, you know, all of a sudden it's not that, it's not mutual. And so the other thing is small self-disclosures may be helpful in establishing trust. And so this can be done. So I've taught for many years. Um, sometimes that can be done. You know, you might've seen a teacher or a presenter tell you a little bit about themselves. You know, already you've heard, uh, well, you've actually heard a lot about me, you know, just in terms of my, my own thoughts, you know, and healthcare provider and that sort of thing. Um, and often, even as we're very, very intentional about self-disclosure within our healthcare field. Um, you know, self-disclosure should always be for the benefit of the client. You know, that is the, that is kind of the line. It's like, if what I'm about to say is not going to help the client, then I shouldn't be using it. You know, then it's, it's not relevant. Um, you know, and so when we're looking at small self-disclosures of, you know, a client going, yeah, I've just felt, you know, fatigued, you know, and I don't, you know, I don't even know how to describe it. 
you know, and then the small, yeah, you, you know, what? I think I've, you know, it, it, recently I was sick and it's just that kind of overall not wanting to do anything and just feeling like, you know, no motivation to just blah. Small self-disclosure, itsy bitsy teeny of, yeah, I felt sick in the past and that's how I felt and I can identify, for instance, gives the client that um, understanding that, yeah, we are working together and that we're not thinking that, you know, you know, I can't tell you anything about myself. Many of you might work with children, teenagers, um, elderly persons, and definitely different generations require different levels of this. And so, and so that's where I always say it's the, I can't say you should tell something, you should not tell something. We don't have those rules, but it's that consideration of, okay, I'm about to say something. How might this help my client? You know, and that's, that's the goal. And so it's, it's so that we can, we can build that trust and demonstrate that. Uh, personalismo. Um, so this in English, it's, it's translated to like a formal friendliness, um, you know, it, it, that personalism. It refers to how we behave within relationships. <clears throat> Clients may expect healthcare providers to demonstrate simpatia or kindness and the personalismo, you know, together. And, and so I, I know I was talking about, you know, so the healthcare provider comes in and you can see it in their eyes. You know, because you can see it in how they behave. Is this a kind and nice person? Um, because, you know, in, in kindness, when, when you show someone kindness through your body, through the nonverbals, through how you talk to somebody, instantly people are more likely to share things that they, you know, wouldn't normally share. And so this, this is done, and all of us have different personalities, so I'd like you to kind of think about how you are. You know, when you approach a new client, um, or just in your life in general, are you more of a buttoned up person? Are you, you know, are you more of a, you know, kind of, um, you know, um, how, how shall I put it, a, a leisurely person? Um, each one of us have, has a different stance when we enter into the therapeutic environment. And a lot of it is formed through our own history of either, you know, the, the world we're working in, you know, I've worked for a long time in government uh, facilities where sometimes it is more important for me to be a little more reserved. Um, but then when I go to my outpatient treatment, I am much more casual because my clientele, many of them who are mandated, many of them are teenagers. And so if I behaved in my one, you know, in, in where I, how I work in state government, you know, very buttoned up versus how I am with adolescents, if I switch those, it would be almost considered inappropriate in terms of, okay, this is, you know, this is not a right for this context. And it's not what people are expecting when they enter into this relationship for both, for both good and bad, perhaps, you know. And so, especially when a family is working with us. So, so I'll give you an experience. I worked in child welfare for quite some time. Um, and in child welfare, often we are entering someone's home. And, you know, and I know many of you do case visits, home visits um, with people, and you're entering their home. And it is certainly kind of a balance because on one end, we have to maintain those boundaries, especially in a home environment where things can get out of hand very quickly without, you know, without our knowledge because we don't control the environment. And so you have to have very firm boundaries at the same time you're entering someone's home, you know, and so our usual, you know, so we have to have that, that, you know, giving out that sense of safety, that sense of trust, that sense of, yeah, I care about you. I care about you. And that's why I'm visiting in your home. I'm a safe person that you can invite into your home, you know, and I'm not uh, overly reserved where you can't sense how I am. And so I think this is very important as we look at the context. Um, additionally, I know, you know, often in telling, in, in discussing with clients of just that, giving them the benefit of the doubt, understanding when things happen, you know, they're late, um, you know, or they're struggling with material. Um, my example for this is I've had many clients who perhaps English was a, um, a second language and they were still, you know, because they were interacting with other um, people in the agency, there were forms they had to fill out or they were working with nursing, which wasn't always available in, uh, in, their, in Spanish in this case. And so they came in and, you know, once they, you know, met with me in, in Spanish, they were often, you know, apologetic. Oh, well, you know, I don't know what she's saying. I, I didn't fully understand the nurse. And that's why I'm having a hard time following instructions. And it was that, oh, well, let me help you. Let me go just one step, one step extra, two steps extra to make sure you're getting what you need. You know, something I didn't have to do in my position, you know, different discipline. However, to ensure the success of the client, you know, it's, it's the right thing to do, but also it's the kind thing to do. 
you know, and not make it a, oh, yes, yeah, fine, I'll help and I'll do, you know, and so, so that if people are sensing that, you know, I always call it the spidey senses that they're, they're watching for. And so clients can feel slighted if those values are not expressed. And so we might feel it, I'm a kind person, but the question is, you know, if I put a camera in your office, what would the camera see? You know, our intention, we can have all the intention in the world to be kind, but what's the client seeing? What's going on with our face? I have loved this period of always using Zoom because I've gotten really good at watching my own face. Okay, probably, I don't know, am I supposed to do that? Um, and seeing when I'm, you know, feeling one way or if I'm, you know, if, if I'm kind of irritated, how quickly does that show on my face? And beginning to understand, it's like, oh, well, this is how others might be perceiving me based on some of my facial expressions even. And so I highly recommend if you're participating in the Zoom world, watch your face, you know, and we can get, I think this is going to really benefit us as we go forward of just being able to kind of monitor, do I seem kind, you know, even if that's my intention, you know, and do I seem kind? Do I seem like a person? Do I seem approachable? Because that's the goal here. And if we're not expressing it, you know, it doesn't exist. All right. And so secondly, we have fam uh, familismo. Or familism, which I've never heard used in English, so but we'll, we'll work with it. But familismo, familismo in uh, Spanish describes the client's focus on family and their community group as a source of identity and support. And so this is, and I don't think I've had a webinar yet where I haven't mentioned the cultural formulation interview, the CFI. It is in um, the back of your DSM-5. And so, and I constantly recommend it because it has a wonderful, just, it uses the questioning so well. So if you are currently doing assessments and they are the black and white, you know, what problem brought you in here today? You know, how is this affecting, affecting you? Take a look at how those questions are written because they are written in a way that allows the client to share their values, the things that matter to them. So I highly recommend using that kind of as a resource. And so as we're talking to them and asking the questions about, you know, what does your family believe about your problem? You know, what has your family recommended to you? And what have you tried thus far? We are getting information on how the client can, um, how we can incorporate family members or other important people. Um, and we can also become aware of who they use in their life as a source of their identity and support, which ultimately, when we're looking at addiction, when we're looking at mental health, that, um, in my experience, is often the, the thing, you know, the, the one little straw that can make or break, break the success in recovery. You know, it's so important um, to have that, that support. And so this, this value here really helps with that. And so, but additionally, as we become someone's treatment provider, or we start working with them, we become a part of that group. And I think it is so important that we recognize that. Um, yesterday in my group, you know, so I have a group on in the evening and uh, adult, adult clients, um, it's an addictions group. And we were, it was interesting because in the context I was talking about just um, cognitive distortions and how, you know, how we really identify them and address them. We were using CBT. And as we talked, one of my clients, you know, I said, well, eventually you're not going to be here with me. Eventually you're going to go off, you're going to finish treatment, and I won't always be here to go, hey, that's a thinking error, you know. And one of the clients is like, you are permanently in my head. He's like, when I go out and I'm driving around or doing whatever, and all of a sudden I think, oh, that's never going to happen instantly. I hear your voice going, that's a thinking error. Say it again. <laughs> And I, I, you know, as I see it, you know, and this, this individual, you know, he's, he's a Latino client. Um, and it's that whole, I have become a part, not just of his mind, um, you know, but a part of his support system, a part of how he even thinks of, you know, thinks of me and thinks of the work that we've been doing is my voice, my self, my person has been attached to some of the work that we've done. You know, and so it's not just about, okay, what are thinking errors and to, you know, write it down, take notes, and it's it's a topic unto itself, separate from me. You know, for this individual, you know, his comments kind of made it, it's like, okay, you, who you are is embedded into my head of yelling at me and telling me, hey, you know, he's, I'm the person that he's, it's kind of the little, uh, you know, I don't know if I'm an angel or demon. Um, whoever I am, you know, the angel or demon that's sitting on his head going, come on, you can do this, you can do a little better. You know, and so, and that I've, I've seen, you know, especially with a lot of my Latino clients of, I become kind of a part of, of their community here, you know? And so the boundaries might be flexible between family members 
And so one of the things we have to avoid pathologizing relationships that may be supportive. So this is where, as we think about our own relationships with our families and friends, um, you know, in my work, I've recognized that it is very, very different. You know, I'm, I'm sure if you go even around your neighborhood and visit every single home and learn where their boundaries are between family members, very, very different. And so pathologizing is when we start to take it and go, oh, well, this is because or you have this problem because of this relationship, that relationship, instead of working to understand, well, how does this impact? Why? How is this in your values? You know, as I look and I was, um, you know, thinking about a, a session I recently did where the individual, my Latino client, lives with his mother. And this is something it it will always, you know, always be, you know, this is not going to change. It hasn't changed when he has been married, hasn't changed when he's had girlfriends. This is just, this is, his, you know, living with his mother as part of his relationship, you know, and much of it is because of his responsibility. And she's perfectly independent, could live on her own. They could separate. However, he sees it as, hey, you know, we're here together. You know, I, why would I, you know, if I move, my mom's going to move with me. That's just what gonna what's gonna happen. Um, and part of my uh, part of his job, you know, as he sees it, is to support her. Her is to you know make sure she's doing okay, and is to constantly have that relationship. And and he was telling me about every single night. Um, you know, his mother's out of town. It was was out of town for a little bit, and he was telling me about every single night he goes to his mother. You know, at the end of the night for a blessing. And he was like, yeah, this is something she's been doing since I was a little boy. You know, and this man is now over 40 and he's like, but, you know, he's like, this is so important to me that every single night I get that blessing. And so, so he was talking about his mother's absence. It's just, wow, that's, that's you know, I, and I really feel that absence of not getting her blessing in person. You know, and so as we look at that relationships, you know, in some families, you know, that might be perceived as, you know, what are you doing? Come on, let's separate. Go, you know, start your own family. But for him, this was incredibly supportive, incredibly important and a source of emotional support, you know, that, that we're looking at. And, and our job is to be flexible with that, is to be flexible with that understanding, even when we're sitting outside, not necessarily seeing the, you know, oh, yeah, that makes sense to me, you know. All right. Of course, respeto, which is respect. Um, and this refers to the respect given to professionals based on their position. So one of the things I like to mention is there are, I believe it is seven different types of power, maybe eight. Sometimes they add another one. Um, I, if you type it in Google, you can see the seven types of power. Um, and, you know, it's used heavily in business um, environments. And one of the um, one of the powers, there's expert power, knowledge power, and informational power. And so what we have here you know, is expert power. I am, I have power just because I'm an expert in things. I know things, you know, people tell me that, hey, you know things and therefore we should respect what you say. You know, even informational power, when clients come in, they're usually looking for some information, whether it's how to solve a problem or a phone number to help to get them to the next, you know, spot that they should be in or help to fill out a form. And so, understanding and owning that we have to own the power that we have so that we can understand the impact on our clients you know and especially within the latinx population you know this is you know this is often a value that they have not for everybody of course none of these are for everybody but often this is a hey you are a professional person you are educated um and therefore you know we have this respect um and so however we have to be very careful with this you know, because also it can lead to the, you know, the impact on that relationship or engagement if we don't, you know, see it for what it is. And if we don't work to make sure that we're empowering our clients, because that's our role is to empower our clients so that we can help them and, you know, make sure that we are, are problem solving with them, you know, in a way that's relevant for their life. And so some of how we do this is, is you know, when I first see a client um, or especially a family, you know, using titles. I never assume that I can call, you know, even even sometimes I find the, hey, you know, oh, mom, you can sit over here. Dad, why don't you sit? And I know we, you know, often people do that frequently uh, because it's easiest, you know, okay, I'm working with the kid here. Okay, mom and dad. And even that is very, it's actually very casual. Um, and so, but, you know, first out of the gate, it's that looking, okay, you know, you know, Mr. Mr. Ramirez, Mrs. Ramirez, you know, how, whatever you're doing so that they can see there is respect here. And then as you work on that relationship, if it does become more casual based on the family's needs, based on, you know, the, the interaction and the treatment's needs, you know, then you can change. But it's that making sure that you are um, kind of owning that position. You know, I understand that I am a professional here. You're coming to me for a service because that often is, it can be what's expected. 
you know, and then once I have that relationship, you know, often we get much more casual, you know, to, to improve comfort and just that trust. Yeah. All right. And so, so those are the values that really impact engagement. And so our goal is to be mindful of those as we continue on, as, as we develop that relationship and also be able to reflect on our own values that we are bringing in, you know, and again, we might value, um, you know, if I value, um, you know, relationship over respect, huh, you know, I might enter my, you know, my healthcare provider's office, you know, in a casual way you know, as opposed to, you know, and I might bring all of my ideas for my treatment and what I believe my my uh, my illness is. And so versus if I value kind of respect over maybe that, you know, relationship part, I'm going to enter, you know, and act and behave very differently, you know, and so, but this is on both again, to build that kind of mutual relationship that we're we're going for. All right, so our next piece here are cultural values that impact the treatment phase. All right, so values that most affect the treatment phase due to the pervasive way that these values impact the client's perception of identity may be machismo, marianismo, and fatalismo, okay? And so as we talk about these, what we're looking at, um, you know, especially when we start talking about treatment, and I know we've previously had a couple of webinars that talked about how we, you know, the client's understanding of illness the client's understanding of distress and how that impacts them. You know, as we think about how the client um, even conceptualizes who they are as an individual, that impacts how they enter treatment, you know, whether for mental health or addiction issues. And, you know, their understanding of am I a, you know, what is my role? What are the expectations for me as a person can impact um, how, they, how they look at treatment and their responsibility. It can also impact their understanding of what they need to do. Um, additionally, as we look at just roles, you know, within the family, uh, later on we're going to talk a little bit about family treatment. And so, as we think about family treatment and how different roles, if we're doing family treatment, home visits, work with the entire family, work with children, understanding how these identity roles and how our client may be impacted within the family, you know, as we look at machismo, marinismo. You know, how does that, what is expected within the family for our client? You know, and so these can really help us understand when we might be recommending a treatment that might be very appropriate for one family, but due to some of the roles, it may need to be adapted. You know, and again, I'll emphasize the adaptation. So the first one to understand is machismo. You know, so I know this is a word that unfortunately gets a lot of bad press, um, in my opinion. And so in, in reality, it's a form of masculinity that involves having pride, being courageous and valorous, but it also promotes male dominance and superiority. And so on one side, and this is what, you know, and so frequently I've worked with, um, with Latino men who the machismo is very, very important for them. You know, as we interpret it as, you know, having pride for who you are, both your cultural, your maybe your nationality, but also who you are as a family member. You know, there is pride in that, you know, and I see this in many of my 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 clients, my male clients, you know, uh, they're beaming when they have children, you know, when they have um, opportunities where their family has done something wonderful, you see that pride coming in because it's like, yes, this is this is my creation. You know, this is my family of, you know, my my chosen family that I protect, that I am prov providing for. And that is something to be so pride, proud of, you know, and so, so they get this here. However, you know, every value, it's, it's like a two-sided coin, you know, is how I think about it. Because every value, even I, I told you a little bit, a bit earlier about how I have a value of responsibility. And so wonderful, except in the wrong context, because then, you know, sometimes I can get a little rigid and go, no, it's, this is what I have to do. This is my job. You know, I'm, I'm responsible for this. When someone's going, hey, you got to let this one go. And so every single value, it's like a double-sided coin. In the right context, it can be wonderful. But if it's in the wrong context and used poorly or rigidly, you know, all of a sudden it's not as helpful. And so this is where we're looking at this value and, and the other values that we'll, we're going to talk about. But, you know, so machismo, as that, that family pride or that pride in self, it is fantastic. And this is something I work to groom in my adolescent clients, especially as they're becoming young men. However, 
Then when we look at male dominance and superiority, this is where it goes wrong. You know, and so I've seen this with some of my adolescents that I work with, um, where, you know, they're, they, they kind of have this bravado, you know, and they're entering and they're talking. And even in therapy, it's very difficult for them to share weaknesses, to share struggles. And so we have to start talking about how identifying your struggles and your weaknesses and getting help is actually very courageous. Um, personally, I use, uh, I, I love to use superheroes, um, and therefore I have to watch all the superhero movies. That's the only reason why. It's really just to, uh, you know, for treatment material, you know. Um, and so I love to use superheroes. And if you, if you ever went to, you know, a high school English class and they do the superheroes, uh, the hero's journey, um, and it's a wonderful model. And so you can, you can Google the hero's journey. And I often use that model in talking to my clients who are typically coming through addiction, something bad happened and they were referred to me. And so they're looking at going, okay, you know, this is who I was. It hasn't been going well. And then this thing happened. And now here I am. Because what we really push is that courage and valor to overcome difficulties and weaknesses. You know, not with the ultimate goal of being a perfect person, but with the ultimate goal of growth, you know, and being able to benefit others, you know. And so this I found extremely effective, especially with my adolescents, but I use it with my adults as well, um, because it helps put it in perspective. You know, all superheroes have a weakness, you know, you know, Superman and his kryptonite, and, you know, you have all the other superheroes, even though they have courage, they have value, valor, they have pride. But when done, you know, when when it's not right. And we have stories of superheroes where they go and they do it the wrong way. You know, they kind of get full of themselves. They separate themselves from family and friends and the people that they are sworn to protect. And all of a sudden it goes downhill really, really quickly. And so, so this has proven to have been a really great model that's been helpful for me. And so, you know, so back here. So when we have this very strong value, um, men with this may struggle to accept appropriate emotions and vulnerability, like I mentioned. And, you know, and this can cause just the ineffectiveness of, um, of treatment work. And so that's where, you know, as I'm, I'm thinking about this, that identifying going, yes, this is what this is. And I've talked about, you know, machismo, you know, when I work with um, non-Spanish speaking clients, you know, we, we talk about, um, you know, kind of that, that pride is usually how we define it, but, you know, the good side of pride and the bad side of pride of being too proud. Um, you know, and when I identify it, we can work and therefore it doesn't impact um, treatment. But if we let it go and we don't address it and talk about it for what it is, um, it can be very, very um, damaging. Or um, if we talk about it in a way that's demeaning, you know, the way that doesn't respect it as a value. Because that's the other thing. This is, you know, if we're like, well, you can't be dominant, you can't be superior, you know, you have to, you know, you have to change. And we're, whenever we're working with any of the values, um, cultural values or otherwise, if we start to demean them or talk down or pathologize their values, you will lose people very, very quickly, you know? And all of a sudden, because you literally don't get them, you know, it's that you don't understand where they're coming from. And so that's, that's super important. And so the opposite, the female form of machismo is marianismo, you know, which is less used. So this incorporates the concepts of saintliness, submissiveness, humility, and vulnerability. Also include, it may also include the role as a provider and having, having a strength to raise children. And so when I work with female clients, you know, again, values are double-sided. And so this can be used very, very well um, in terms of, you know, helping them understand, um, you know, understand themselves and what they want. You know, help them understand when we're, when we're looking at their value, it's that, okay, what do you want for your life? You know, how does this fit in, in terms of even being vulnerable as a strength? You know, being able to take in other, um, you know, take in other um, opinions and be able to work within that and be able to support others. But it's also bringing in that, that strength part. And, you know, I like to, especially, I don't look at this as, as just having a strength to raise ch children, but having a strength you know, as, as who you are, you know, and talking to them about what that involves. You know, sometimes that's that strength to provide for your family. You know, I work with many individuals who are single mothers and we're looking and going, look at this, you have that strength to provide for your children. You have that strength to be a great role model. You have that strength to, to you know, as you go to work and as you do well in work and you succeed, um, you have, this is a strength that you have 
to care for your family. And so it's phrased differently in many ways. Both of these are, are very, very similar, you know, but they're slightly different just in their phrasing. And so therefore, you know, especially as we are looking, and I know these are very um, gender biased, you know, they're very male and female. And so as we're talking to individuals who might not identify with either female with either male or female and we're talking or we're talking to individuals especially latinx individuals who you know who are um ex who are identifying with other genders we have to talk about these as values what are your value apart from necessarily the parts we have you know but in terms of the value um you know which is which is a little bit um which is helpful for them especially you know as they they work to identify what their identity is you know and who they are and what their values are so that's i'll put this that's out there as you know we can separate it from the actual biological um sex to understand okay let's let's adapt this for your gender you know and your values and so women with this value are more likely to minimize symptoms or neglect treatment to care for family like i mentioned and again, you know, our goal is to develop treatment plan that considers their values regarding treatment. And then lastly, in terms of our values is fatalismo, is the concept that an individual cannot change their fate, you know? And so they may be less open to new technology, it may have less drive to manage their own healthcare in favor of trusting a higher power. And providers must respect individual beliefs while offering education and options. And so, you know, earlier I said values have two sides and I'll continue with that even though this one in, in the therapy world where we love change, we are agents of change. Um, I want that, I want a t-shirt that says that. Anyway, we are agents of change here. And so when we're looking and going, oh, well, if they're coming in going, I can't change, this is just how I am. What is the benefit of that? You know, what is the other side of that where it might be helpful? You know, we see kind of this as we're looking at that spirituality part, you know? And so in, in a, and I'll give you, I'll give you the little Easter egg. In acceptance and commitment therapy, what we use it for, we actually call it creative hopelessness. In terms of it's that, you know, you know, sitting here and you might have that fatalismo, but at the same time, can we open up to whatever, you know, can we open up to that? I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know the solution right now. However, there may be other options, you know, and our job is to really be attentive to who we are, attentive to our experience, be attentive to what's happening, you know, observing our thoughts, observing where we are right now in the present and attuning with our current needs, you know, to become more flexible in this moment, you know, whatever might have come. And so, you know, I've worked also sometimes with nihilist clients and, you know, and so sometimes we, we end up here in a very, very negative way and our job um, sometimes in the initial parts of our work is to start working on flipping it to be more appropriate again flipping that value so that we can work in that in that place of the okay you know and so so let's talk about what how we're managing this you know and how we're managing your emotions um, it's very delicate work certainly because your clients you know at least in my experience they keep wanting to pull you back but well, there's nothing I can do it's just always going to be bad you know is, is usually the bent and so, but our job is to continuously, you know, bring them back to that, you know, if there is a trust in a higher power, you know, then maybe we need to connect with that. If there is a trust in something else, you know, and so let's talk about how this, you know, how this is important to you, you know, respecting those individual beliefs um, and offering options, you know, and again, supporting them through that. Um, and so I think, again, you know, what's very important is, is that not pathologizing their beliefs or their values, because if you come into this and, uh, you know, and you pathologize, go, well, this is what's wrong with you is you keep thinking nothing's going to change. Of course, you wouldn't say it like that. Um, but you say something much more therapeutic, but it means that same thing. All of a sudden, we're going to have an engagement rift. You know, because the client's gonna be like, yeah, you totally, totally don't get me, you know. And so, um, so sometimes this can definitely be a difficult one because we, as as treatment providers, are typically very biased toward everybody can change, but that's our bias and our value certainly. All right, so therapeutic um, in elements of the engagement phase, and so development of the therapeutic re relationship. So as we develop. Um, there can be differing experiences of justice, oppression, and discrimination which impact the establishment of therapeutic rapport. 
So I'll refer you back to last week's theme, our module four. Um, I can't remember how it's labeled here, but last week's module, um, which did talk a lot about context and content and how these relate to culture. And so as we look at this, our differing experiences of, of justice and oppression, as we're sitting there and going, oh, well, that wasn't that bad. Or, oh, well, I don't know why you're really complaining. Well, this is just the world. Our world is a racist environment. And so, you know, we just got to kind of get through it. Um, again, pathologizing experience can be extremely harmful. And thus, the opposite of recognizing of, you know, tell me more about your experience. I want to understand, you know, how this impacts you. I want to understand, you know, just your experience of justice and oppression. Because I know, no matter what, it's different than mine. You know, and that can help me. And so, so just showing that interest, not requiring education. You should never require your, your client to educate you on their experience as a, um, you know, Latinx adolescent or a person of color. We're looking at the whole, can you inform me about your experience and how that impacts you? Because I want to understand your experience. And so the areas that are most impacted in the engagement and treatment phase are in the expression of empathy, transference, and countertransference. Yeah, the provider must consider the client's values and suspend judgment to understand the client most accurately. And if you go back way back to the beginning, you know, probably our first week of, of these webinars, you know, that we've been doing, being able to suspend judgment of, you know what, I know, I believe I know something about your culture, you know, generally. I know a little bit about your community. I know a little bit about your family and I know a little bit about you. However, that does not qualify me to judge any of it and so keeping that open mind that, you know, I want to hear what you have to say. I want to understand your experience, ask questions when appropriate and recognize it's not static. In other words, the client's experience um, can be, you know, one experience when they start treatment and it can change. You know, I see, unfortunately, sometimes we get into this, this path of going, well, you used to say you were this and now, you know, you're not saying that anymore. What happened? It's like perspectives can change, especially in therapy or in therapeutic interventions when we're developing insight. Sometimes that first, nope, I've never been abused. I've been okay. Everyone's always, you know, my family, you know, they're fine. It can change as they develop insight into, oh, well, this was harmful to me. And I now understand the impact. And to be open to that movement, you know, and even their values of, you know what, I never thought this was important, but now I recognize this is a value that I have. You know, and so, and that's part of our goal as we work through the change, you know, is just suspending that judgment initially and then throughout the process. And so empathy, I love empathy. Um, first of all, I love to receive it. I love to give it, um, even when sometimes it's hard. And so, but what empathy is, and there's all sorts of definitions, some I'm sure you've heard there's even lots of, if you go on YouTube, a lot of videos on empathy, um, and they all give you slightly different versions. Um, when you look at the research, there are all sorts of definitions and research on empathy, of empathy. And so, so here's one for you. Let's see how you like it. Empathy is a feeling in oneself, the feeling of others, you know. And so Brene Brown did a wonderful video on empathy. Um, I can't remember the title of it, but there's a bear and a moose. You know, it's a cartoon one. So, so you can YouTube that one if you look at for Brene Brown. And, and basically it talks about, it's, it's, it's feeling, it's sitting down with the individual and going, yeah, get it, you know, and not questioning or giving the, well, at least, you know, at least this didn't happen or buts or ands or others. It's just the whole, yeah, yeah, I, I get it, you know, and so our role is to seek to empathize with the client regarding their experience based on an understanding of each of their culturally based perspectives. You know, and so that's part of, as we've talked about all this engagement, you know, opening it up, understanding the values that make certain things important to them and other certain things not important to them. You know, I don't know if you've ever had a session where you keep trying to get your client to talk about certain things. You know, I keep bringing up this topic and they keep changing the topic. Yeah, sometimes it's because they're avoiding the topic. Other times they're like, I don't, you know, that's, so not even important here and so not even a thing <laughs> and you know obviously our clinical you know our clinical judgments going okay yeah i gotta pull this apart a little bit or i don't you know but sometimes the culturally based value and perspective it's like oh you know what this is important for me not necessarily for the clients you know and, and recognizing that again who am i asking this question for and then this empathy offers clients a rich opportunity to resolve their own ethno-cultural conflicts 
So Lillian Comas Diaz, if you have an opportunity to look through some research, and I'm sure if you, you know, put in Google, you can find some of her work, has done some fantastic work in terms of understanding our own ethnocultural conflicts, and even in, in some of the things I'm going to talk about in a minute here, just transference and countertransference. She has done beautiful work. Um, I met her and I was like, you know, I was just in awe. I got my picture taken with her. Um, and I get really excited about it because she has done so much great work in terms of this, in that therapeutic moment, how do we express that, that feeling? You know, how do we express that empathy? And so um, the provider should, you know, as we're looking at them, we are, are really trying to, trying to engage and bond with them here. And so speaking of this, so uh, transference. So transference, you know, go back to your Psych 101 classes. Transference is when the client attributes unconscious thoughts and feelings to the provider. Provider's openness to ethnocultural transference may lead to a deeper therapeutic experience. And so this is when, you know, so um, I often, and this was actually with an African-American um, um, adolescent who, who came in. And so he came into my office, real huge guy, you know, and I, you know, not usually... Um, considered a larger person, you know, and so so he definitely, you know, just dwarfed me. He was a really, really big guy. And he came in with his grandmother. Um, and and so they were here. And, um, and so as we were talking, the client was super reserved. Grandma did all the talking during the first uh, initial intake. Um, and then as I started to see him independently, he was very, very reserved, you know. And then when, you know, I started to push him a little bit in terms of the, you know, hey, you know, trying to pull out a little bit more information, you know, and just trying to get a conversation going, you know, it was the, well, you don't like me, you know, I know, you know, you just, you know, you just think I'm this, you just think I'm that. And, you know, and I'm, and I'm seeing and hearing these things. And as I was, as I started to pull through, you know, kind of what he was with me for, you know, first of all, the treatment, you know, and, and we talked about, and it wasn't, you know, for him, it was a little bit racial, but it was also this, you know, I'm no good. You know, I've messed up now that I've messed up, you know, why would you think you can help me? Why do you think I'm helpable? You know, and so, so all of a sudden I started to find that he had taken some of these thoughts that he had both conscious and unconscious of, you know, what he had done to get into my office, but also his only, his own thoughts just regarding, you know, race and ethnicity, um, the judgment that I might have about him, whether, you know, I thought that whether I was going to see him as a human you know, as a real person that I wanted to help and that I cared about, you know, and so as, as we're talking about this and, you know, we started, it was a, it was a beautiful conversation because it's like, ah, you know, you, you know, where you like struggle and you're like, what am I doing and how am I going to help this individual? And then all of a sudden you have that conversation where it's like, oh, this is like the stuff that's between us. And all of a sudden we found that there was a lot of transference that had been happening in the previous, you know, couple of sessions which, which he wasn't even aware of. And once we started talking about it, we were able to address a lot of it and just how his own identity, you know, and what had happened and his belief about me, you know, him looking at me and going, okay, this is who you are, you know? And, you know, it really led to a wonderful discussion that opened up that therapeutic experience and ended up being a wonderful relationship, you know? And so our openness to that, you know, and understanding even, even as, you know, at some point, you know, he's like, well, you know, you're racist and you said this and you, you're, you just think this about me and you think that about me. And I'm like, I don't believe I've ever thought those things at all. You know, being able to open them and, and receive them, you know, receive them as valid in his mind. You receive them as a real thing that's happening in that moment allowed us to work through it. You know, I didn't get mad or even defensive. I, nope. What are you talking about? I've never seen none of that. It was like, okay, well, help me understand that, you know, help me understand where that's coming from, you know, and, and or tell me, you know, is there, you know, what have you, what is your experience of even our sessions and how they're built, you know, and how, you know, this space and me, you know, tell me more about that, you know, really led us to a wonderful, wonderful experience. And so then, of course, there's the opposite, which is countertransference. So this is our own repressed feelings in reaction to emotions, experiences, or problems of a person undergoing treatment, specifically related to the race and ethnicity of the provider and client. The goal for the provider is to be aware of biases and to explore the impact of these biases and supervision to avoid an impact on the client. And so, you know, some of these things when we're working with clients and, you know, it's, so let's just put it out there. As treatment providers, we are not perfect. 
sometimes clients come in and they rub us the wrong way. You know, it's just the whole, hmm, yeah, I, there's just something about, you know, I don't, you know, it's something in the way they speak, something in the way that they're handling themselves, something in the way, some of their assumptions, you know, as they, as they talk to me, you know, there's just, it's just rubbing me the wrong way is the only way that, you know, that I can phrase it. And usually, you know, it's like when I'm feeling this thing going, okay, what's going on? You know, I, I remind myself to, to go back to my own, okay, what are your biases? You know, you've known this client for all of two sessions and you just keep going back to the whole, oh yeah, you know what, there's just something gritting, you know, about seeing this client. And it's, okay, what are my biases? I don't know this client well enough to know about anything in particular, you know, at this point, but it's, what are my biases? What are my beliefs? based on, you know, nonverbals, based on their person, based on, you know, their culture and what I believe about it. You know, what I believe about, you know, this client compared to other clients, you know, that I've experienced and what I might believe in terms of similarities or differences, you know, and so where am I coming from and how is that impacting, you know, my own emotions, you know, and it can happen in a negative way. It can also happen in a positive way. You know, I, I frequently, and I'm, I'm thinking of a client that I have that reminds me of my father. And it has taken a lot of, and I, and I recognize this, and I know this, and there's certain mannerisms, you know, where you're just like, oh, you know. And so as you're working with this client, well, as I've been working with this client, it's so important to get supervision, so important to, to talk about this, you know, so that, if you, that I can look and go, okay. You know, as I think about my responses, as I think about treatment, what's going to help this individual who has mannerisms like a loved one, but is not my loved one, um, what do I need to watch out for? You know, especially if I'm if I'm pushing them and holding them accountable, you know, and supporting, you know, and even topics, again, we are looking at content, content that might be important for this individual. But as I start thinking about my own, you know, family norms, what we talk about, what we don't talk about, communication and those sort of, you know, and those sort of things, how my family communicates, you know, what am I bringing in from my own, you know, world, my own biases and experience, you know, and in, in, inferring onto this client, you know. And so, um, and, and that is super important. I know I, I was, um, and so I'll share, I like to share my weaknesses with you as well. I remember I had a client who, and I have, my family is is just notoriously light. Um, I've had to adapt a little bit working in a hospital environment, but I, I you know, in, in terms of my family, if we see our, say our uh, our reunion is going to start at um, 12 o'clock, we're all there by three, usually, um, maybe later. And so, you know, I was talking to a client and I, you know, made this observation and because this client was always super early, you know, and so I made that, this conversation, I'm like, oh, are you, are you always this early or just for me? Because, hey, you know, it's, you know, and I made this assumption because he and I, our families are from the same area in Mexico. You know, we had a lot of commonalities. And so all of a sudden I, had, I put that on him, you know, and just this belief and even started seeing how time affected his, some of the problems he was talking about. And I was just making a lot of assumptions. And he's like, no, he's like, time is really, really important to me. And all of a sudden I'm like, timeliness was actually a value for him, you know, of being on time. And there was a very, you know, and I had been missing it the entire time about how time and, you know, and being attentive in that way was so important to him because I was inferring my own biases and, you know, my life, you know, on, onto him. And so, and again, I'll refer you back to the work of Lillian Comas Diaz, who she has a wonderful article. It's a 1991 um, article with her and Jacobson, where they talk about some of this transference and counter-transference and it's very readable too, and how it impacts, um, it impacts our perception. And so the impact of an intercultural relationship, you know, so this is individuals who are racially and ethnically dissimilar can pre present with some challenges that I, that I have mentioned. So sometimes we can endorse color blindness, deny importance of ethnicity and race, overly focus on culture, uh, feel guilt, pity, or aggression toward the client, or feel ambivalence regarding cultural experiences. And so this is where, especially in the world that we're in now, you know, as we look at, you know, civil unrest where a lot of things are happening, and where some people are, you know, struggling for, you know, fear of their own safety or, you know, in, in their own community. Um, and all of a sudden, you know, if, if you know, and we're exposed to so much discussion about this, you know, and so looking and going, okay, well, how is this feeding into my own biases and then impacting the thing, how I'm working with my clients? 
And so also the client might demonstrate this um, by demonstrating overcompliance and friendliness as to not reinforce stereotypes. Demonstrate mistrust, suspicion, and hostility like I described from my client I described a couple minutes ago. Deny the impact of it or just demonstrate ambivalence of, well, I don't care. You know, so in my first example, you know, of, of me and my, my big team, um, you know, there was a lot of this, you know, that I was seeing and uh, just from assumptions that were happening between us that needed to be clarified. Yeah, and so as we look at this, the impact of evidence-based therapies on engagement, so th there's a huge impact as we go forward, you know, thinking about the specific EBTs that we use. And so some of the, you know, there are many recommendations, and I know at this point, if you've seen our cultural adaptation webinar from last week, um, as we're looking at um, specific treatments, the cultural adaptation of cognitive behavioral therapy, it is a specific um, CBT you can find. I know SAMHSA on their website, they have a lot of these that are available. It's developed for adolescents with severe depression, and it considers and adapts cultural development and socioeconomic factors. You know, and so as they developed this particular resource, they actually looked and researched the, the impact of the cultural adaptations because it's, as we look at EBTs, EBTs are good when there is fidelity. In other words, when they follow the, follow the model. However, as we know with cultural adaptations, sometimes we have to make adaptations which impact the fidelity. And so, you know, and that is a definite area of research to make sure that it's still evidence-based. And so, you know, so SAMHSA does have this um, you know, as a resource that, that you can take a look at just in terms of how they, they adapted it um, to make sure they were meeting needs. I know a lot of, a lot of this, and adolescents are, are wonderful for this because in their actual adaptation, they brought in a lot of family, they brought in family members, you know, in the CBT to actually work and reinforce a lot of the skills. Um, and so they adapted for, you know, both those persons so if we remember the ecological validity model, they also adapted for content in terms of what they were talking about to make sure that it was culturally relevant, you know, and, you know, and that it was relevant to the community. Um, they were looking at socioeconomic factors just in terms of, you know, making sure that what they were talking about was, was doable in the context. You know, I know there are some therapies that rely very heavily on perhaps technology or you know, or other things that may or may not be accessible. Or if you have a parent that works long hours or, you know, different shifts where you don't see them. And so these were a lot of the factors that the, the treatment worked on on adapting for to make sure that it was reliable. So dialectical behavior therapy is another evidence-based treatment, sorry about the fonts there, um, that is, you know, that has been culturally adapted. It focuses on the capability enhancement, motivational enhancement, and the generalization to outside environments. It can be adapted to integrate elements of the individual's culture. And so this is a therapy as well, you know, just like CBT, which I know I've talked about throughout our webinar today, but DBT is also one that can, you know, can be very helpful um, to actually use the client's world and their understanding of the world. It is very, very much based on their perspective. You know, and so this can be very, very helpful as well. And then motivational enhancement and therapy. Um, so again, you know, SAMHSA does have information on this available. And so looking at it, it uses an empathic and strategic approach to increase the client's motivation to change. And so again, we have that empathy part, which is so important, just in terms of making sure that individuals really feel and are engaged, but, act, but we're also looking at the strategy. You know, it's not just, it's not just that all, all feels all the time. You know, it's also looking of, okay, planning it out, you know, and motivational interviewing is fantastic for making sure that we're consistent, you know, when we follow that model. It can also be adapted to integrate clients' beliefs, values, and context to maximize the benefit of treatment. You know, and so we, as, as we look at, you know, and I love that context part, because as we know in the world today, you know, there's so much of that context that's shifting, you know, and so this is, this is an extremely important point here. And then we also have trauma-informed therapies. Um, seeking safety is one, um, and there's multiple, again, going to the SAMHSA website, you know, can be very helpful. Seeking safety is an evidence-based counseling model used to help clients who have experienced trauma and substance abuse. Um, the goal is to help clients attain safety through a focus on integrated and holistic treatment, ideals, 
cognitive behavioral interpersonal and case management and the clinician's process. And so, you know, it, it, it helps us. And I, I know several places um, you know, use, and I mean, this is, this is very, very well known, especially for trauma. Um, and, and so I really appreciate just how it does look at, again, the individual where they are and their perspective, but it gives you room to adapt as well. And so, um, and this is, this is also workbook based, um, for those of you that use workbooks. So the trauma recovery and empowerment model is a group treatment model designed to empower, provide trauma education and build skills. And so this as well, you know, you can see, find more information on the SAMHSA website. It's highly adaptable to the cultural values and beliefs of the Latinx population. You know, and so as we're looking, you know, providing trauma education in, um, and again, when it, when it gives us room to bring others in, when it gives us room to look at the values and even when trauma um, impacts a family, you know, impacts individuals, how can we help, you know, identify their values to give us the path to work through trauma? You know, because ultimately, you know, especially when we're looking at trauma-informed therapies, we're looking at that, you know, looking at that meaning making and being able to move on to their next, you know, to to move toward healing. And so those values and beliefs are so important in, in that process. And so this model helps give us that. And then of course, family therapies, you know, in terms of family therapies, there are a lot of different ones, structural family therapy, you know, um, you know Bowen family therapy. There are so many that are very, very good and useful. Um, and of course, you know, as we're talking about persons um, using the family of, of choice, you know, if there's, whether it is the, the specific family or whether we're looking at friends, um, I think I've, I've mentioned that um, I've had many clients, many of my adult male clients bring in friends. You know, here's a friend that I've known for decades who is going, who can be helpful. And I know their family, their family knows my family and is an incredible source of strength when it looks at actually keeping, you know, supporting them. You know, for those that are working in addiction, often I say that addiction, the the opposite of addiction is not sobriety. The opposite of addiction is connection. It is impossible to maintain addiction in a place of connection. And so as we're looking at, and this is one of the reasons I love family therapies, because it really helps strengthen those connections and provide the accountability to help people be successful as they move toward recovery. And so these can be used also to identify those cultural interactional patterns family interactions and educate the family as a system. And so when you bring, um, you know, I, I believe it was Mnuchin that said, when you bring the family into the room, you now have the problem in the room, you know? And so it's, it's right there with you, um, which I think is also why so many people are, you know, starting off a little bit hesitant on family therapy. So here is, oh, I do have a list for you. Um, here's a list of other family therapies um, that are evidence-based. And so, you know, I highly recommend taking a look at these and all are proven um, effective with the Latinx population. And so um, here's another list that you can, you can take a look at. All right, and so at this point, I think we have a couple of minutes here. Um, let's see, do we have any questions? Things that I can um, continue with. Sorry, Michelle, I was talking with my microphone microphone on mute. Yeah. Yeah, it happens. So yep. um we have a lot of comments saying thank you for a wonderful presentation. Um to all the attendees, you can send your questions in the question tab on your control panel so we can ask Michelle if you have any doubts. If you want any suggestions about the everything she talked in this wonderful presentation. Isa, I don't know if you're there. You can hear us. Hi, yes, I'm here. Um so Michelle, can can you provide um like a little bit more information regarding why we need to pay attention to the um Latinx cultural values in mm -hmm. therapy? Mm -hmm. like so certainly so today's presentation really talks about the latinx um, values and 
And so I know these particular values, when, when I look through lists of values, so you can go, you can go and Google, I usually do a value sort often, um, and you can Google and, um, you know, often when I, when I look up a list of values, a list of values for activities that I use in my therapy, they do not include these. You know, they are very, you know, generally the lists that we use for therapeutic purposes are very based on, you know, English speaking North American values, you know, or, you know, values of individuals in the United States. And so therefore, as we're looking at working with different populations, we have to be aware that there are values that are definitely more emphasized that we see more often. And that as we are even interpreting it, you know, so again, as I'm using values to help individuals to decide where they're going in their path, if I can't hear that as a cultural value, that's something that is very embedded in how they see their identity and how they see themselves, um, I can often miss or, you know, again, just, just push it off as ah, just another value as opposed to seeing its impact on their perception of their community, their perception of their family and their perception, perception of themselves, you know, and so we, we know that much of the research um, and many of the, the resources out there are based on majority op populations, you know, and so that's where I think is, you know, as we work with the Latinx population, we have to be very mindful you know, first of all, as healthcare providers to advocate uh, for our clients to make sure that they are getting uh, relevant, um, you know, relevant uh, information and, re you know, relevant treatment. But also we have to advocate for the, the special areas that might, um, that, that might impact their particular culture, you know, and, and start from that place of understanding. Thank you very much. We have another question. How do I help a parent um, to understand that their child has depression and that the child is not faking the symptoms. Mm -hmm. Maybe like so, to provide a way how to explain or provide psychoeducation to their parents. Yeah, certainly. Um, so usually, I think often, you know, when we're working with clients and, and working to express it, um, we we have to get to that and i know with this this in particular you know i've worked with many adolescents with with this particular issue and it's the you know okay you know we can both we can come from different places of believing you know of the origin of symptoms but the symptoms still exist you know the behavior still exists and you know and i always look at the okay well parent what have you tried thus far you know well i believe they're faking it and so i punish them i put them in the room and my question is is that working you know, and often the reason they're in my office is because the things they've tried, you know, he's faking it. And so I put him in his room. I take away his computer. I do this is not working, you know, or maybe they've been sent to me by the school because of these issues, you know. And so our job is to offer offer an alternative, you know, is to look and go, OK, you know, well, you're trying all these things based on, you know, your belief of where the illness is coming from, your belief that the illness is is faked, you know, they're making it up. And so, you know, so I, I usually move toward the just look, looking at the specific behavior and going, okay, perhaps this is true. Let's just say, you know, perhaps it is. Keep an open mind. However, you know, we have to do, you know, I always, I always say, do what works. You know, at this point, you know, it looks like your child, that these are the symptoms that they're showing. And, you know, and it's moving them toward the let's try something else and also looking at their values and going, well, what is important to them? Why is it so important that this child does not have symptoms? You know, and so that's sometimes a question I pose as well. It's, so let's just pretend. Let's just just for a minute. We're just going to pretend. What if it were true? What would that mean? And I don't know, you know, and some some parents are, you know, um, well, I don't believe mental illness exists or whatever it might be or it might be something else. You know, but it's trying to get that person to, you know, either A, explore the motivation for making sure that, you know, that everyone knows the child is faking it, you know, or just getting very, very concrete and going, okay, well, you know, based on, I'll keep my, my mind open, you know, and I accept your explanation of it. However, you know, as we look for treatment, you know, we have to use skills that work, you know, and what's going to help, what's going to work for your child. You know, and sometimes that means trying other things. It is it is a very difficult situation, you know, and then, of course, there's always that just psychoeducation. It's like, yes, I know you don't believe in this, you know, depending on how forceful they are. Let me just tell you about this, though, though, you know, and we'll we'll maintain these both kind of uh, possibilities. 
but let me educate you on how I see things, you know, and, and I keep bringing it back to myself. This is how I see it. You know, this is my experience and, you know, and, and try to help them and through that relationship and that engagement. And I've definitely had individuals where at the end of the day, we've agreed to disagree. You know, they're like, well, I believe they're faking it. And I'm like, you know, okay, you know, I'm, I'm not seeing that. However, we've come together and go, okay, well, what's the solution though? You know, what's the solution where both of us can kind of move forward from this, you know, and I make some suggestions. It's like, well, based on my experience, here is what might be helpful, you know? And so, um, you know, and then exploring those motivations, but it's, it's definitely not an easy case, but those are some of the things that I kind of, you know, work with, um, you know, and motivational interviewing sometimes can be extremely helpful with those. Thank you. Um, the next question is, any comments or encouragements of, for undocumented immigrants and mental health treatment? Is yeah. this invisible and how to coach coming out if identify? So certainly. Um, I know this is so important that establishing a safe place is so important. And so one thing that I do is when I'm asking for personal information or demographics, I tell people why. You know, if it is, you know what, I'm asking for your social security number because we need it for insurance purposes. You've told me you have insurance. And so, you know, I see you left this blank. And so we need that, you know, for insurance purposes. That's all, that's the only reason we use it. Um, you know, and so I, I look at that sometimes in that very initial demographics. Um, also being, you know, making sure and monitoring that, you know, my speech about certain topics. Um, and, you know, just like, just like we might do, I know, you know, within our healthcare field, we've gotten much more of the, you know, can, can you tell me, you know, can you tell me what gender you identify with? You know, can you tell me, you know, what, um, you know, can you tell me, uh, um, who, who you're attracted to? Can you tell me, you know, so we've, we've gotten much better at asking broader questions so that we can invite, um, information, especially when it might be hard to, share you know we're no longer asking are you you know male or female you know we're having that you know do you know i assume because you're male you like females and so we're broadening those questions so in looking at that anytime we're looking at something difficult to ask it's that broadening the question of the okay can you tell me about you know can you tell me about um uh your citizenship if you think you know if, if that's a relevant topic you know or can you tell me about you know sometimes it's the can you tell me about your adolescence and then, well, where did you work? And when you see, um, when you see, like they tell you, well, yeah, I lived in, you know, lived in another country for many years, you know, and then I move here, you know, I, I might ask, oh, you know, have you ever had any any citizenship issues? You know, have you ever had any impact? You know, or can you tell me about how that was? And so it's just broadening those questions where, you know, I don't know. Sometimes again, and it's it, it's it's it, is it relevant to treatment? You know, and when we think about what's the relevance of the immigrant experience. That's what we're looking for. And so, um, you know, it's that, tell me the story about, you know, your immigration experience. What was that like for you? You know, and then the, you know, if it's like, well, yeah, you know, I, I crossed over and, you know, I, it wasn't in a, um, in a regular path or, you know, they're not explaining it. It might be, okay, did you have issues with documentation or, you know, and so it's just opening those things up in a, in a, um, a useful manner. You know, and again, asking it's the how is this going to help the client? You know, um, and we're really looking for those stories usually when we're in treatment and, and in mental health. Yeah, so. Thank you very much. That was the last question. Thank you, Dr. Michelle Evans, for a beautiful presentation today. And remember, everyone, that you will receive a link where you can complete our evaluation. Thank you very much to every one of you and have a beautiful afternoon. Bye.